Okay, uh, thank you, Marco. Thank you everyone for attending um, on this beautiful Saturday. I'm joining you from San Miguel de Allende, uh, Mexico, Central Mexico. Uh, Marco, if my internet connection becomes unstable, just let me know. Um, All right. Okay. Um, yes, uh, thank you everyone. I've been colleagues with Marco for uh, probably close to 10 years now. Uh, we both live in Austin, Texas, and um, today I'm going to give you kind of an idea of what uh, I do as an interpreter working in, uh, really working mainly in personal injury. Uh, I work for several court, uh, courthouses in Central Texas. Um, I've done medical interpretation, I've done child protective services, I've started from the very bottom and have worked my way up uh, to running a, a successful practice in uh, Spanish English interpretation. Um, and today, so I'm going to give you a, uh, an intro to what I do working with Central Texas and really at this point now with remote video. Uh, all of the uh, law firms in Texas who do uh, personal injury. Um, so I'm going to start my presentation right now. I have children running around, so uh, I may have to stop to manage uh, now and then. Okay, here we go. Um, my screen. Marco, did that work? Yes, it yeah. says that you've Perhaps started screen sharing. Long. We're still waiting screen. for the image to appear. See here. Oh, here we go. Okay. You're trying to share, but you're not sharing. Okay, there we go. Um, let me know when you are able to see uh, the first slide and I'll begin. Okay, maybe. Oh, uh, okay, uh, it sells on screen sharing. Window. You're doing something wrong, Seth, because uh, there's no image. Okay, I'm back. Let's let's try that. Well, let's try that again. Okay. All right. There we go. Are you, is Marco? Is it up? Yep. It's up. You're okay, up. Okay. Great. great. Um, all right. All right, so I'm going to give you the uh, give you an introduction to interpretation of personal injury. injury. Uh, again, where I left off, thank you all for uh, attending uh, this webinar. Uh, some of you I've seen before, some, some of you I have not, some of you I have worked with before. Um, my name is Seth Hammock, and uh, this is a, a little bit about, about me. Um, many people ask why I don't uh, really uh, write software anymore. And uh, that's kind of a, a complicated question to answer, but uh, I still am involved in uh, IT development uh, a little bit. Um, I still keep up some of my programming skills. I recently finished a certificate through Google's DeepMind project and deep learning um, using the Python computer language. Um, and I do uh, quite a bit of other things uh, regarding, uh, regarding and, and interpreting, as you can see. Um, so I've lived in uh, Bolivia and uh, Mexico, um, India and Bangladesh. Um, I worked on IT programs for, for youth in those countries um, uh, from 2003 to 2008. Um, and my contact email is below, lonestarinterpreting at gmail.com if, uh, if you want to get a hold of me. Um, and you can also likewise um, check out uh, a platform that I've been working on um, called gosignify.com. Uh, that'll probably be a whole nother session, but it's a freelancer platform solely dedicated to uh, interpreters, uh, professional interpreters. Um, it's 100% free to sign up. It doesn't cost you anything. Um, payouts are made within 48 hours and you keep 100% of your fees. Um, if you have other questions, just reach out to that email. So, okay, so uh, we're gonna talk about uh, personal injury. So personal injury in the United States uh, is under the category of tort law. Um, 
and really uh, it, it, it includes quite a few different types of cases, um, but it is, it, it's a civil matter. Um, and it's, it, in some cases it can have criminal implications, but it's usually handled in the civil courts. So that is tort law that we'll be discussing. So some examples uh, of those cases that I do, and I'm, some of you may have worked on uh, different kinds of cases in personal injury, um, but the ones that I commonly see uh, in my practice, and probably I would say 80% of my business, 70, 80% of my business is in personal injury. And so I uh, interpret slip and fall cases, um, construction accidents, and auto accidents. Those are typically the cases that I'm working on. Uh, but of course, there are other kinds of cases as well that, are, uh, that, that fall into the category of personal injury. But those aren't going to be as common cases as you see uh, as an interpreters probably won't see those kinds of cases too often, which are the uncommon cases like defamation or product liability. Um, typically, interpreters are going to be working in the, those common cases that I mentioned uh, before. Um, and if you would, if you have your microphone, if you would just mute that, please, um, so as to not interrupt. Um, so obviously uh, with cases like uh, the uncommon cases, uh, again, you're not going to see uh, too many interpreters. I do know federal interpreters who work on product liability cases, but it's not really, uh, those aren't the common cases that we generally see in the US through uh, local personal injury law firm. So um, what I want to do is give you an idea uh, about the, the, what the phases of a personal injury case are, uh, according uh, to, to my experience and kind of where I've been involved in uh, those, those phases. Um, so obviously, it, a personal injury case starts with some type of accident. Um, in this case, what we're focusing on today is, is going to be uh, auto accidents, but it could be something like the slip and fall cases um, uh, or construction accidents, right? So when an accident happens, there's an investigative phase where uh, parties other than the law firm are collecting documentary evidence. So that documentary evidence uh, for a auto accident um, or an 18 wheeler case would be something like um, uh, photographs, uh, uh, police reports, um, medical records. And in this case, what I'm going to show you uh, further, in the, further on in the talk is going to be uh, documentation from the, the uh, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. So there's all of this evidence that is collected during the investigative portion of a personal injury case. And again, this is data documentation that's collected by parties other than the law firm at, at this point. So, in these accidents, you'll have an injured party uh, or parties. And so they're going to look for some type of treatment. Um, uh, most of these accidents uh, typically deal with uh, personal injury. Now, it could be that there's some type of property damage as well. So in construction accidents, it's not necessarily always a, an injured worker. It could be a faulty construction, um, is, is typically a motive for some type of lawsuit uh, that falls under the category of tort law. Um, so it's not always someone being injured. In this case, what we're going to look at is with law firms who are special, who specialize in personal injury, they're typically going to focus on uh, injured persons as, uh, as the basis for filing a, a lawsuit. And so those injured persons have gone through um, the, the in investigative 
phase has happened in the case. Um, third parties have collected all kinds of evidence, the federal government, the police, hospitals, uh, maybe even the plaintiffs themselves uh, have taken pictures at a, uh, at a, at a crash scene um, or have collected other witness statements, for example. And so at this point, the, the plaintiffs are going to be treated by medical professionals. Now, of course, this is one phase where we may see interpreters involved doing medical interpretation. Um, typically what I see in personal injury are the plaintiffs are going to, um, to receive some type of physical therapy. Um, it, that could be something like um, you know, with a chiropractor, for example, in many cases it is a chiropractor, but not always. If the injuries are se severe enough, it, there may be uh, orthopedists involved or uh, neurologists involved, um, and sometimes even uh, people who have to have prosthetics, those kinds of uh, specialists in medicine are, are brought in. And all of that uh, information is, is also part of the investigative phase. All of, all of these medical professionals are developing these documents that will probably be included uh, in the, the lawsuit. And so where interpreters typically find themselves is in it, court interpreters uh, it, it are typically find themselves involved in the resolution phase. So after the investigative phase, all that documentation has been collected by the third parties. And then during the second phase, the treatments happen. This is when the plaintiffs say, well, um, these medical bills are a, a lot and I don't feel like uh, I'm at fault and perhaps the parties cannot pay for these medical bills or property damage. So this is the point when they reach out to an attorney and they talk about relief. They talk about getting some type of compensation for uh, what has happened to them or their property or both. And so this is when the attorney uh, carries out the consultation with the, with the potential plaintiff. And if they decide that, uh, depending on the severity of the case, they may send a demand letter. So a demand letter is what a law firm Seth, I can't hear anything. I... <laughs> Let's just hold on a second. I'm sure he'll be right back. Sorry about that. You want me to jump in and take over? His microphone yeah. is muted. His microphone is muted. Maybe he accidentally muted himself. Seth, can you hear us? We can't hear you still. Yes, I, I can hear you now. Sorry, it, it mutes when it comes back on. Okay, so where was I? Um, demand letter. Thank you, everyone. I, I am at, I, yeah, the demand letter. I am in Central Mexico, and so sometimes my internet connection is not great. So um, we've talked about the demand letter. So this is when the, the law firm will send the demand letter um, to the potentially liable party and they'll make demands about some type of restitution. So the idea behind the demand letter is to avoid accruing lots of litigation costs. Um, and so again, depending on the severity of the case, the law firm may use this as a first step for their resolution of the case. So if the demand letters, if, if the, the requirements of the demand letter are not met, or the opposing party uh, simply refuses to make to to uh, accept responsibility, then the law firm will go through the process of filing in the court. Um, so they'll actually open up a court of record um, and establish that there is an active lawsuit being filed by the plaintiff through the attorney. Uh, against the potentially liable party. So once that happens is when the letters go out, the, the plaintiff's law firm will send out letters to the potentially liable, uh, liable party or their law firm. Uh, hopefully at this point, the other party has hired a lawyer or, or lawyers to represent them. 
And this is whenever all of the evidence gets exchanged. So this is a, a very, very important phase in, the pers in a personal injury lawsuit where uh where all of the evidence is is exchanged so from one party to the next and um after this discovery phase is a possible uh, settlement phase um if there's no pre-trial settlement then the case will go to trial um so anyone who's worked a lot in the american the judicial system knows that 98% of cases will settle before a trial, but there are those rare few that wind up going, uh, going to trial. So what we're going to focus on in the next few slides is the discovery phase, because the discovery uh, phase is where all of the evidence is exchanged and also witness testimony is recorded on the record. So, um, hey, Seth, can I jump in? This for is whenever the parties. Um, Excuse me, Seth. I I can't hear you, Seth. If you're talking, oh, okay. Well, that's a great little pause there. What I was going to do is throw out a question to the attendees uh, <laughs> while we wait for Seth to come back in. Okay. Uh, here's a uh, question time. <laughs> Uh, the word discovery is one of those terms of art in the American legal system that's kind of hard to interpret into other languages because it doesn't really mean discovery in the typical connotation of the word. So whatever your working language is, we've got like five different languages represented here. If you have a favorite term that you use for discovery in the context of sharing evidence between parties in a lawsuit, please put that in the chat and we'll just compare and see different ways that you can interpret or translate the word discovery. So the, uh, the Spanish term that's being suggested here for the non-Spanish speakers means uh, revealing the evidence, uh, revealing the evidence to the other side in the lawsuit. Revelación de Changing pruebas. Evidence. Yes, I've heard uh, intercambio de pruebas is one. Yeah. Yes, I, I, divulgación I, de pruebas. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So probably whatever word is normally used in your language for discovery is in Columbus discovered America. That's probably not the best uh, term of art for the legal context. Yes, um, I, I found intercambio uh, makes the most sense in Spanish to okay. Spanish speakers because there's an actual exchange. It's indicating the exchange of the, uh, of the evidence between the, let's just say the law firms in this case. All right, thank you. Back to you, Seth. Okay, I'm going to share the screen, everyone. Uh, it seemed when my internet drops, it does seem to connect quickly. So thank you for your patience. I'll do my best to hop right back on. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, we were talking about the discovery phase, and we're talking about during the discovery phase, during this exchange of evidence that includes also not only all of this documentation I mentioned in the investigative phase, but this is the depositions. Interpreters like myself, we love depositions. Um, interpreters in general like depositions, court interpreters, because they do pay more than other work. Um, and it, depending on what state you're in, depending on the limitations around tort law, uh, you can find lots of work typically in, 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 um, in personal injury. Uh, and so again, the, the last uh, sentence under this definition is important. Statements made under oath are, uh, are admissible, usually in court. Um, and so uh, in some cases, uh, they'll have uh, what they call an in limine hearing um, at this point. Um, if statements are made under oath that for some reason, one reason or another, are not going to be admissible in court. So that's typically going to happen pre-trial. This is if the settlement is not reached, they're going to have an in limine hearing and both sides are going to pull out their transcriptions of the depositions. And they're going to say, OK, um, so and so said this and this relates to let's just say for example a criminal matter that's pending we can't allow that in um, and so um, typically if there's some personal injury that has to do with it with the drunk driving 
Um, there may be uh, some kind of in limine motion uh, to uh, prohibit those statements from being used in a civil trial. Okay, so linguistic challenges. What, why are, are these, uh, why are depositions so difficult? Um, it's because in cases like the 18 wheelers, specifically in my case, I, I, I work with law firms who specialize in um, heavy machinery accidents and 18 wheelers. So you have the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Act, the FMCSA. That language is uh, particularly dense uh, and, and convoluted. Um, and so as we're going to see going forward, it's a lot of technical vocabulary, it, it can be. Um, so during a deposition, depending on the accident, how the accident happened, um, the driver, uh, for example, or the owner of the transport company who hires the drivers may have to go on the record and say, you know, what is your role in, in, in managing these drivers? The driver may have to come on as a, as a second, as a primary witness and say, this is how the accident happened. So um, in, in your language, you might have things like, you know, how did the truck jackknife? Was it a tanker truck? What kind of chemicals was it carrying? What was the weight? Uh, what was the speed, velocity, all of these things. So those kinds of exhibits that are presented can really, uh, can, can really result in having these complex narratives. And this is where uh, lawyers are really hanging on every word um, that you're in, in, interpreting. Um, and so I've had lawyers ask me before they've hired me how I would uh, interpret certain pieces of that narrative. And they'll have a Spanish speaking lawyer or they will have um, a Czech interpreter uh, agree or disagree with, with, what, with the way I'm interpreting something. Um, now, fortunately, I've been doing this a while, so I've learned how to interpret most situations. Definitely not all, but, but most. So, and the last one is number four is, is, in, is I, I say it's strongly adversarial. So, in a medical interpretation, you have a collaborative. You've probably heard this, those of you have, who have gone through some interpreting training. There's collaborative and adversarial. Collaborative is something like community interpretation. You're trying to help someone. Uh, rent an apartment, or you're trying to help someone get some child support, something like that. Um, well, I'm sorry, not child support, um, uh, some type of uh, uh, a home to live in uh, if there's some type of domestic violence, something like that. Uh, child support is definitely not, not collaborative uh, in most cases. Um, but I say that this type of situation is not collaborative or adversarial. It's strongly adversarial because there's typically a lot of money involved. Uh, someone's life or limb is on the line, uh, depending on the severity of the injuries. Um, so the interpreter is the bridge between these parties. It's between the, the, the plaintiff's party and the defendant's party. And so the defendants may want to video record. I've been in situations at a conference table where there have been 15 lawyers and it's me and uh, a witness at one end of this conference table. There's, uh, there's studio lighting, there's uh, a large camera at the other end. Um, and it can be an extremely stressful situation, something far more stressful than being in a, in a, in a courtroom, of course, uh, witness testimony is something that is particularly special, but I think at least in a situation in a courtroom, you're probably going to have uh, other interpreters there to support you. You're going to have a team there. The judge is going to be usually supporting the interpreter. The 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 other, uh, if it's a criminal case, the, the prosecution or the defense, whoever you happen to be working for, is going to be there to support you. In this situation. You are, you are on your own for the most, for the most part. Um, the people who have hired you really, uh, they're not, if, if you make mistakes, they're not going to necessarily support you. Um, or if you, I'm not gonna say a mistake, but may perhaps a, a, 
what they consider to be an inaccurate interpretation, they're not going to support you. You are on your own. Um, to that end, there are going to be regular objections, depending on the skill of the attorneys. Um, uh, there's going to be regular objections. Those objections may be well-founded. Those objections may not be well-founded. Those objections may be simply there to set up for some type of appeal. So you have to be uh, on point. You have to be focused during uh, those kinds of depositions um, where they're, where, that are highly contentious. They're strongly adversarial. Um, you have to be able to push back. I've had law, I have clients who are uh, law firms who will hire me simply because I am not afraid to say, uh, to express my feelings regarding objections. If I feel an attorney is, is, is objecting uh, simply as a, a superfluous objection uh, to, uh, to rattle my nerves uh, or simply to uh, have some type of uh, basis for an appeal, um, I let it be known that uh, if, if it happens third or fourth time, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put on the record uh, my feelings around the objections. Um, and I will uh, state that the, you know, the objections going forward are completely uh, acceptable uh, insofar as there is a legitimate reason for making an objection. So that's one thing that makes this strongly adversarial is that there's going to be challenges and those challenges aren't, aren't always legitimate. If they are legitimate, you need to be able to push back uh, or simply admit that there could be another interpretation or simply admit that yes, you are incorrect and the council is correct. So this is an example document here of a case that I worked on recently. Um, there is no personally identifiable information here, um, but this case was uh, an interesting one because the, the driver happened to have uh, 66 uh, violations um, on his uh, report from the safety measurement system. So below you can see that there is a, uh, there's a web address there. You can go and check out the safety measurement system as administered by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Anytime an 18-wheeler pulls into the scales on the side of a highway, an entry is made. Um, anytime an 18-wheeler is pulled over by a police officer, an entry is made um, on this report. In this case, there happen to be 66 violations. On this page, there's, there's 30, but in total, there were 66. And you can kind of get an idea of what language you might need to be interpreting as you go through this document, because the lawyer will have this report uh, in front of her and she'll be reading off, uh, uh, you know, uh, I see that there was a failure to use a seatbelt while operating a CMV. Can you tell me a little bit about that, right? Um, or uh, further down, you can see that it gets, uh, more technical with regard to the uh, the parts of the truck, um, the clamp or rototype brake out of adjustment, um, glazing permits less than seventy percent of light. So these are kind of terms that hopefully you can get a copy of this kind of exhibit before you go into the inter go in before before the the deposition. That's usually not possible. Um, if you happen to be uh, new to these kinds of depositions, um, it's important to, uh, it, to ask for these kinds of documents if possible. Uh, they won't always uh, comply uh, and give, give you these documents ahead of time. Um, but there's always uh, the artificial intelligence tools uh, to help. Um, I have DeepL open usually. If I'm on site at a deposition, I'll have DeepL there. Uh, open, um, or if I'm online, I'll have DeepL open or, or Google Translator, whatever it is you choose to use. Um, so you can quickly get some type of answer um, regarding uh, how to interpret some of these technical words. So um, these are questions that I uh, 
came from a, a different case, um, but I've changed some of the name. I've changed the names and the information, but. Uh, this will come in the settlement phase. This is called a minor prove up. Uh, in this particular accident, um, a vehicle uh, was struck, resulting in injuries. Um, and these are the kind of questions that I had to interpret on the fly during a, uh, a minor prove up in front of a judge. And so these are the questions you're going to get. And Typically, I do these consecutively, so I take notes as I'm listening to these kinds of questions. They can get pretty dense, especially when you get down to the bottom with those kinds of numbers. Um, it can be very complicated uh, if you don't write. If you don't, if you're not taking notes uh, as a court interpreter, you're doing it wrong. Um, you're not going to be able to handle this this level of density. Um, so. Those are the reasons that kind of make these depositions and these uh, settlement hearings uh, going into it, uh, uh, some type of resolution of the case, which makes it strongly adversarial. Um, okay, I think at this point, Marco, let's, uh, let's uh, have some questions. Um, if you would like to ask some questions, you can put them in the chat, uh, or Marco, if you wanna facilitate questions. Sure, you wanna stop sharing screen so we can See your face. Are you keeping the video off because of bandwidth? I, I am, yes. All right. I'd like to ask the first question, please. Um, I saw an acronym in the sample question that the attorney might ask. I think it was CMV. Um, can you give us some guidance on how you handle acronyms or jargons that are specific to a particular industry? Well, uh, in, in in this in this case, uh, what I do is, is like because I uh, am, am typically um, interpreting these kinds of questions, I will hop onto the FMCSA website and look at the list of acronyms. Um, you can find the acronyms there uh, on the, the website. So I'll ask the attorneys generally what a case is about. Um, if it involves an 18 wheeler. Uh, and so I know what kind of documents I'm most likely to see and what questions I'm going to get. So a day, my day before, uh, I will go uh, through those acronyms. And if I happen to get that report, for example, um, I'll go in there with a highlighter and I'll write out what those acronyms mean. If nothing else, to give myself a clear idea of what what I'm interpreting to the witness. So I look for resources. Basically, I I I have a collection of documents on my computer and even printouts of acronyms that I'll use for specific kinds of cases. Um, with with documents that like this, the system that met the the. Uh, safety measurement system, those are all standardized. And so you can just, there's documents that just have all of the ac acronyms um, for you. So I'll typically have those open as well as I, when I go into a deposition. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna read off some questions that are coming up in the chat here, trying to like combine and simplify ones that are similar. Um, for a, as a Spanish interpreter, how do you interpret minor prove up? Oh, that's good. So. Um, so a prove up is interesting. So you, a prove up in Texas, I don't know how, how it is in other states, but in Texas, a prove up is basically a uh, establishing of facts, uh, establecimiento de los hechos, and este caso es por un menor. Um, so it's establishing the facts. That's what it is. Um, and as you saw those questions, or the last question uh, the, the, on the last slide, those questions came from the minor prove up. And the purpose of that kind of hearing is simply to establish the basic facts around the settlement. So, uh, okay. establecimiento de los hechos. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question, how common is it at depositions to have to use long consecutive? Oh, I would say, okay, that's, a, that's right. a good question. That's a good question. So, um, 
perhaps this is something maybe for like the business of interpreting, but I think interpreters in general have, it's difficult to prove your value to your clients, right? They're hiring you because they don't know your language. Um, so they have no insight to your, your abilities in general. One of the skills that I demonstrate that proves my value is my ability to do long consecutive. And I have had many compliments around my ability to do long consecutive, especially on the witness stand. Um, so if you're trying to differentiate your services and your skill from other interpreters, if you're not practicing long consecutive, you're missing out. Because when people see you do long consecutive in the courtroom or during a deposition, they can't help to be impressed <laughs> because it is an impressive skill. So long consecutive is very common. Um, I have a colleague of mine who does not like consecutive and he tries to interpret or, or he does interpret simultaneously during a deposition. Um, and I think that's a no, no. Um, so uh, it's very common. And if you're not doing long consecutive, then then you're, you're not taking advantage of an opportunity to differentiate your skills from other interpreters. It's the only way I think that you can demonstrate to those who don't speak your language that you are highly skilled. Thank you. Good question. Um, next question. When a term comes up, a technical term that you don't know, what are some survival tactics for handling that? You know, um, I have found that early and I found that myself as a new interpreter uh, years ago, and when I meet kind of new interpreters that there's this, um, there's this defensiveness that goes along with it. And if there's any objections, uh, there's an immediate reaction uh, to being to, have, to hearing an objection. No, that can't be right. I know what I'm doing. Um, uh, that will hopefully go away with experience. Uh, if I don't know something, I simply say I don't know it. Um, and uh, your clients will appreciate that. Um, it's quite the opposite of what you think as a new interpreter, somebody who's just beginning to build skill as an interpreter. It's the complete opposite. Admitting error, admitting mistake, uh, mistakes and, and, and correcting yourself are the signs of a, of a skilled interpreter. It's, it, it's the opposite of what you would think as a new interpreter. Um, you know, how dare you challenge me? I know, you don't know. Um, the defensiveness will will go away as you build skill and you have a better idea of of, uh, of how to handle yourself in a stressful situation. Okay, great. Uh, next question: um, Is it more normal to interrupt a witness narrative frequently when there are many details? Um, if there is a narrative from a from a, a non-technical witness, I typically will not interrupt um, unless it begins to be rambling. If it's a coherent narrative, I simply take very good notes and I focus. Um, I use what's called um, uh, the method of loci, um, which is, uh, there's a book called Dance, uh, Dancing with Einstein um, moonwalking with Einstein, sorry, moonwalking with Einstein. Um, if you haven't read that book, it's a really fun read. And I use that skill, uh, to, 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 uh, visualize the narrative. And I can't tell you how much it helps after I read that book. And I started learning more about the method of loci. I started to really understand how the, that part of the brain um, it really uh, is ideal for remembering lots of details. Um, that part, anyway, you can read what part of the brain is in the book, but that's a really good book. 
Um, so that's what I use to remember and memorize and, re and, and reformulate um, a, a complex narrative. If it's someone who rambling, rambling, who's upset, yes, I absolutely interrupt. Sometimes even your best efforts to interrupt don't even work. Um, and that can be uh, difficult. Um, at that point, you might need to appeal to the lawyers to step in and say, hey, look, maybe we should take a break and let this person uh, you know, calm down or um, you know, perhaps you can instruct your witness or something like that. Um, you know, getting the lawyers involved uh, so they can handle the witness if that happens is fine. But by and large, it is the interpreter's job up until that point to handle the witness. Right? You're the person who is the conduit for the information coming out. Good question. The next question, are team interpreters required for depositions or are they ever used at depositions? I don't wanna share the money with anyone, come on. Of course not, no. Um, I have really gotten to the point where I, uh, if a deposition is going to be something where, where there are multiple witnesses, I've made it a practice now to ask how many witnesses there are. Um, if there's more than two witnesses for uh, a vehicle accident, I will typically suggest that uh, another interpreter join me. Um, that really falls, as of, as of recently, that, that falls on deaf ears. People are starting, a law firm are starting to open up to the idea, um, but it is a question of additional money. Um, and, and to people who don't speak your language and who don't interpret, um, we are really considered manual labor, un unfortunately. And so they just, uh, they don't understand the, the, men the cognitive load that you're dealing with. So. Um, I, as of yet, have only done one deposition where there were two interpreters. Okay, thank you. And speaking of money, um, we're allowed to talk about rates because we're not a professional association here like ATA that has restrictions on that. So if you'd like to share what's typical in your language and your jurisdiction for depositions, you can put in the chat. I'm going to put it in for Texas. Um, this is what I often see to our minimum. Uh, you don't have to share, but um, I'd be curious to see what different uh, different interpreters in different states are making. Okay, I see there's a question from Ramiro Valenzuela. Hi, Ramiro. It's been a while since we've spoken. Do objections get interpreted to witnesses in depositions? Yes. Sorry, that's, I, a, that's a repeat question from somebody else that I also was interested in knowing the answer to. Oh, okay. Um, yes, I interpret uh, objections. So when I start an interpretation, um, I let the attorneys know that I have a few things to say. I want to set up rapport. R trust is very important. Um, uh, you want to let the witnesses know that you're impartial, that you're not going to twist their words and all that, right? So part of that is saying, look, there may be objections. There may be what's typically called the most common type of objection. It's an objection to form. That's an objection in which the lawyer uh, regards the question being asked by opposing counsel as being ambiguous, vague, um, something like that. So I'll tell the witnesses that during my uh, opening with the witness, my introduction, um, that there may be objections and those objections are going to be interpreted, and this is what it means. You're just going to continue answering unless instructed uh, otherwise. Yes, uh, I've had lawyers, uh, sometimes the dynamic during the deposition is, is complicated, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of arguing between the lawyers, and there will be objections, and it's, it's difficult to jump in there um, it's difficult to manage that situation. Um, there's been cases where I've had attorneys get upset with me for not uh, interpreting the, the, the objections uh, for the witness. Uh, so uh, you just do the best you can. It, it's, it, it's, it's really just, a, 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 there's a lot of diplomacy involved with interpreting. 
And I would say that's one skill that many interpreters miss out on is their diplomacy skills. Um, interpreters, interpreting is so much more than language. Um, it, so much of it is, is diplomacy. Um, if you don't know much about that, um, you should investigate uh, di diplomatic skills and crisis resolution um, and, and work that into your, in, into your skill set. Um, I've seen many interpreters, even ones who have been doing it a very long time, who have no idea how to handle a stressful situation and they wind up making it worse. Um, so that would be my suggestion. Okay, thank you. Um, the latest question is, does each side bring their own interpreter or are both, inter are both sides depending on one interpreter? In other words, who hires you? So uh, typically the, uh, the party who has requested the deposition. So remember, during the discovery phase, each uh, side of the lawsuit um, will send notifications out to the opposing side asking them to make a witness available. So the lawyer who's going to be asking the questions is the one who is going to be hiring. Whether that's the plaintiff or the defendant, it, uh, it could be either. Okay, good questions, everybody. Keep them coming. Um, okay, I see. And what about interpreting, another one from Ramito, and what about interpreting sidebar comments and conversations? Um, I typically do not interpret sidebar. Um, you need to keep in mind as a professional interpreter that uh, your, uh, your energy level is, from the moment you start your interpretation, your energy level is going down. Um, if you're trying to interpret every single word and utterance, you're going to wipe out. Uh, you're going to get very tired very quickly. Um, if you have questions about that, you should ask the attorneys what they would like you to do um, or ask your client what they would like you to do. Um, but typically, no, sidebar comments and conversations, I don't interpret. I don't interpret that in court either. Uh, and you shouldn't interpret that in court. Um, uh, uh, one from Miss uh, Manu. Uh, I hope that's how I pronounce your last name. Uh, sorry if I botched that. In your experience, is the rate higher for certified interpreters? Absolutely. Um, certified interpreters are going to have to go through the, the testing and the, and the skill training. Um, so yes, certified interpreters are paid more um, most of the time. I'm sure in some situations somewhere in the world that there are interpreters who, who are not certified for one reason or another that, that can demand a, a good rate. Um, Marta Centeno Cruz, can you please put the city where you are interpreting? I'm in Austin, Texas. Um, but I interpret throughout Texas. I'm, I'm a master licensed court interpreter in, in Texas. Okay. Seth, I think it would be helpful to see. Just show a couple minutes of an actual deposition. Um, these are available on YouTube now, and I found one that's for a trucking accident. And we can kind of see how the lawyers go around and, and, and introduce themselves and some of the special jargon that you're likely to hear at the beginning of a deposition. Would that be all right? Let me let me answer this one question. She's a really good one, uh, Marco, by uh, Renee Koenig. Uh, what do you say when you bring up to the judge that a lawyer has made too many objections? So this is really important. Um, I have had lawyers in uh, civil and criminal cases uh, simply just object, right? Uh, I object to the translation. Um, and my retort to that is, what's the basis for your objection now that catches a lot of attorneys um uh, uh, catches them off guard um but the reason i ask what the basis for the objection is is for my benefit and for the court's benefit i want to know what the mistake was or what was the ambiguity in my interpretation uh, most lawyers don't understand that they need to put a basis for an objection. It, like any other objection, um, during, a, during a civil deposition, 
um, it's pretty common that if there is an objection to form, uh, the opposing counsel will, will say, what's the basis for your objection? The same thing should apply for an objection to an interpretation. Um, again, it's nothing against you. Objections are a common part of the litigation process, but you need to understand what the basis is. So um, I just simply ask, uh, or I, I say, uh, Your Honor, the interpreter would like to know what the basis of the objection is. And in this last uh, case I did not too, not, not too long ago, that the judge looks at the at the lawyer and says, "Yes, I would actually like to know what the objection, what the basis for your objection is." And so, okay. All right, thank you. How about we watch a couple minutes of a real deposition, just as a sample for the kind of language we usually hear. And I've put the link to this in the chat, so if you have trouble hearing my audio, this should you should be able to listen to it afterwards. But this is an actual truck accident case that was recorded recently. This is tape number one to the videotape deposition of Vernetta Sherman in the matter of Robert John Glad versus Marquise Doran Denby, at all being heard before the U.S. District Court for the District of Maryland. Case number 113-CV-02473. This deposition is being held at 2 North Charles Street, Suite 600. Baltimore, Maryland, 21201. Today's date is May 27th, 2014, and the time on the record is 2.04 p.m. My name is Kevin Mitchelluck, and I'm the videographer. Court reporter is Patricia Smith. Counsel, will you please introduce yourselves and affiliations, and the witness will be sworn. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Blumenthal. I represent the plaintiff, Robert Glad. Good afternoon. This is Mark Kozlowski. I represent Mr. Glad as a counter-defendant. Uh, good afternoon, this is Emil Agpan. I represent <clears throat> uh, Vernetta Sherman, Marquis Demby, Joan Wilmer, and Thomas H. Pauls, LLC. Okay, ma'am, I'm going to ask you, please, if you raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give in the matter now at hand will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Paul Blumenthal. You've sat in uh, for the last four hours with Mr. Demby's deposition. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I understand that you're here to testify as the corporate representative for Thomas Paul's LLC. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. I also understand from your counsel that you individually have no claim against uh, Mr. Glad or anyone else in this case. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. I also understand your sister is a uh, Joan Wilmer, Joan Wilmer Paul's. Yeah, sometimes she uses Joan. Lana Wilmer, sometimes she uses Joan Paul's Wilmer, same person. Okay, and I understand that she has some medical condition that she's not able to participate in this. That's issue. correct. Okay, thank you very much. Tell them if they're on. Okay, I think that's a, that's a good little sample of how a typical deposition opens with everybody introducing themselves. Um, I wonder at what point does the interpreter start interpreting? Marco, is that a question for the audience? Uh, no, Seth, I'm just wondering, in your experience, since we didn't see an interpreter in that sample, where would you jump in and begin your interpretation? Um, well, I mean, from the very first question. So is that what you mean? would you be sworn in before the witness? I would be sworn in before the witness. That's right. Um, the swearing in happens before the witness, and then the witness, and, and then uh, you'll, the interpreter will interpret the oath for the witness, and then um, the plaintiff or defense counsel will start with the very qu first question. Uh, you know, good afternoon. My name is so and so, um, and I have been hired by this person, and I am representing them in a lawsuit that you have filed against them. Do you understand that? Okay. That's typically how the first question goes. Thank you. And would you do any kind of a pre-session before um, any of this starts, just uh, maybe chatting with the witness to establish rapport or, or discussing procedures with the attorneys? Yes, I, I do. Um, if, there are, if there are quite a few attorneys involved, and I, and I suspect that it could be contentious, I'll ask if there's any Spanish-speaking attorneys. Um, and I will, as part of my pre-session, 
I will uh, ask them to, uh, that I will be asking for the foundation for objections um, and to make sure that those objections are not uh, hostile uh, to the witness. Uh, sometimes those objections uh, by attorneys can be made hostile to the witness, to the interpreter. So um, I will typically get an idea of what kind of personalities are, are going to be on the deposition. Um, and that gives me an idea of kind of how I need to frame my pre-session. Uh, Marco, if I may interject, uh, I, mean, I think the example that you put up is not the best uh, example because it was an English speaking witness. Uh, whenever the witness I mean, uh, speaks English, then you're, you're there, is, uh, your need to be there is not clear. So unless the, uh, there's a party that's involved in the depot that is not an English speaker, then you would start whisper interpreting to that, uh, to that party uh, without being formally on the recorded uh, portion of it. Thank you. I used an English as example so everybody on the call would understand what's being said. But you're right, that's, that's not how an actual interpreted deposition is conducted. And for those yeah, of you who have, mm -hmm. just a second, for those of you who have to go since we're at the hour point, please look for the exit survey when you close out of Zoom. Um, that's where we confirm that you're on for the full call. But if you don't have to go, if you have a few more minutes, let's keep it open and, and continue with the questions because I feel like we're covering some great content here. Go ahead, Seth. Oh, um, yes, but the, 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 the speed, what I did find useful in that, in that example was that uh, the, uh, the conflict is palpable. You can, you can see uh, that she is, uh, she, she's conducting herself uh, uh, confidently, but she's nervous. Uh, the attorney is, is going right after the questions, uh, one after the other. Um, and that's typically going to be the uh, kind of the, the mood of and the tenor of a deposition like that. Um, do you understand that? I'll just say entendido, uh, understood. Uh, somebody asked me. Question. Do you understand that Spanish? You don't, don't sound condescending. Um, I mean, the, the way the way I frame my my the way I reformulate in, into Spanish, uh, I, I try to to avoid sound sounding condescending. Um, How do you say it in Spanish? Se entiende. I said, uh, se entiende o entendido understood okay those of you who are asking about the exit survey you won't see it until you leave the meeting there's no way for it to display it's just a, a feature that zoom pops up after you close out of this window and if it doesn't work this is kind of an experiment we'll figure we'll work around don't worry i have a i've tracked who's been here at the meeting and i'll be able to confirm this time i'm just trying to make it as clear and simple as possible Yes, thank you. Thanks everyone for for uh, for for showing up. Thank you, Marco, so much for holding these. Um, wow, what a useful uh, opportunity to, yeah, to be bet. able to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, I always love to to speak about my job that I love and uh, what I'm doing. Thank you for taking the time, and I'm sure there are other people on this call with more years of experience than, than I have who are experts at what they do. And if you would like to try a webinar yourself and be the presenter, just let me know. I'm looking to book some more for the rest of the summer and they can be language specific or language neutral on any topic of interest uh, to a, a broad cross section of our profession. I think the pandemic has taught us how to share information um, virtually that we weren't comfortable doing before. And so let's make the most of that. Somebody just posed a question saying, I mean, that if the, if the attorney asks you for your opinion of the truthfulness, I mean, that's, I think that's a very important question that should be very, very clear. I and mean, you should never voice an opinion. 
period. I mean, uh, you should uh, translate or interpret, depending on the case, uh, and never give an opinion in one way or another. I had a judge one time asking me if I thought the guy was guilty. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry, Your Honor, no comment. <laughs> You've got a hand raised from Leo Eric. Yes, I'll be on a few more minutes if there's any other questions. Thank you so much. I just want to make a comment more so than a question. I think it will be very beneficial if you have the opportunity to create reports with your witness or with the client. And with that is to indicate that you are there to interpret, not to give legal advice of any kind to any of the parties, that you are not the individual that is there to uh, obtain any benefit for the outcome of this trial or the deposition or anything like that. Matter of fact, I always post that if you do not want me to say anything, don't blur it out. Because as an interpreter, I am going to say whatever you are saying. So yeah, you I think that, that making work. yourself clear on that perspective will avoid some embarrassment or comments that are not related to your job. Yeah, I've had uh, out of yeah the, the ten years I've been doing interpretation I, that's i've had uh, encountered that situation maybe once or twice uh, just not very common uh, people don't solicit opinions very with any regularity um eric Lau, did you have a question eric thank you for joining eric uh hi seth uh, this is off topic but a, a quick question uh i know that you have a monthly uh, online meeting at the first Thursday of each month. Um, so do you still have that? I attended a couple of times. Thanks. Yes, you, yes, you did, uh, Eric. Um, this was for uh, the freelance platform for professional interpreters, Go Signify, that I am working to establish. Um, I have discontinued those uh, for now. Uh, I plan to do something similar um, in the future, uh, perhaps with some favorite colleagues of mine or not, I'm not sure. But uh, Eric, we will we will be in touch about that um, and let all of the participants know uh, when those are online again. Thank you for that question. Thank you. I have a question, and it is related to the state of Texas. Um, yes, uh, yeah. the people use certified interpreters. When are you? Uh, when you say the people uh, use sort of, when you got the people, um, did you clarify? I am sorry. My son just came in asking me a question and I lost track of my question at all altogether. No, 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 no worries. You, you were asking if the people use certified interpreters. Uh, so, uh, in the state of Texas, we have uh, a range of interpreting uh, of, of interpreting skill available, um, from community interpreters to medical interpreters to um, to state and federal and diplomatic interpreters. Oh, that's very interesting. And um, uh, is the judicial system uh, imposing that you utilize certified interpreters or? It's state, it, 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 yeah, yes, it is embodied in state law, uh, the, the, the code of civil procedure, um, it, regarding what we're talking about now, um, personal injury, where uh, you must have an, a master license to interpret on the record, yes. There's there's a possible exception if the county where you're uh, doing the case has less than 40,000 people, then the judge can allow for a non-certified interpreter to act as an interpreter. Yeah, there's there's uh, different rules for different languages too. Yes, uh, I, yeah, I'm I, again, my answer was with regard to personal injury and Spanish. So Spanish is the is uh, the second most common language in Texas. 
And so that falls under the rule that I just stated. In the big cities. Um, I am in, from the state of Michigan and unfortunately in our state, um, when the pandemic hit, there was a tremendous halt on the process of um, certifying interpreters. Uh, matter of fact, um, it was uh, it was a requirement that for those who were qualified interpreters, it take the certification exam, and then afterwards, um, the most important concept of the certification exam was to pass the consecutive portion of it, in order to maintain your certification, so to speak. Then afterwards, you had a year to pass the whole full test, which encompasses a a simultaneous interpretation and sight translation. But that came to a complete halt. My state is not offering the test at all, and it is not making it a requirement nor for qualified interpreters or certified interpreters to do anything at all. I don't know if you have noticed that in the state of Texas, things are evolving and you are going back to doing the test. What state are you in, Ines? In Michigan. The, the system is evolving here too. It's um, understood different ways by different people and there's there are political forces at work and it's not always, the laws aren't always enforced. It's, uh, it's the system's evolving. I think it's a, it's a state by state um, a battlefield for language access rights, really trying to convince the stakeholders that uh, a professional, a language professional can make a real difference in access to justice. I also wanted to comment, if you don't get much deposition work as an interpreter, the best place that I've found to connect with clients is court reporting agencies, because at least here in Texas, it's the court reporters who often recommend or book the interpreter if the lawyers don't already have an interpreter that they work with. And so you can send an email with your resume or your credential to all the court reporters in your state um, or court reporting agencies, and they will add you to their list of interpreters to call when your language comes up. Yes, as a matter of fact, little secret here, uh, I've got about two minutes left. Um, I have worked very closely with some of the top court reporting agencies in Texas, and I uh, am on the Texas court reporters uh, email thread. And so I see all of the exchanges from 3000 different court reporters come through uh, when they solicit for interpreters anywhere in the state. And so uh, that was made possible by someone in the court who uh, wanted to make sure that my skills were made available to a wider audience. So yes, court reporters are your friends. Um, cool. Any more questions before we call it a call it an evening, call it a day, head home, hit the pool. Thank you everybody for joining us. This has been interesting and, and informative. I'd like to give you a round of applause, Seth. Thank you. Thank you. And tune in thank next you. Saturday. Thank you. thank you. We're still working on the session for next Saturday, but I'll announce it by email on Monday to everybody who's here.